one of the things that we have made a core value of at our church is effective leadership. As we think about what leaders mean and what they do and what they help us do in our organizations, or in particular in the church, leadership needs to be effective. We've studied churches, pastors, we've learned about mistakes, we've learned about things that have caused churches to decline, what have caused churches to struggle, and usually at the very heart of it is leadership, poor leadership. And so this week, we took our staff, we invested in them, and we went to the Global Leadership Conference that's put on by Willow Creek a Church in Chicago. They've been doing this for over 25 years, and several thousand around the country uh, go, and they are inspired, and they're encouraged to be effective leaders. And so this week, that's what we did. We took the staff and a few others in the church to be a, a part of learning how to become a better leader. Greg Groeschel, who is the pastor of Life Church, we have one of his satellite churches here in town. He's a phenomenal preacher, and he is the host, and he started off by telling us that everyone gets better when leaders get better. And if we are able to see better leadership, then he's saying that the church will be better. This will be true in business. If your leaders are better in your organization, then the better the organization will be. The more fulfillment, the more joy you will have. Effective leadership. We learn how to maintain a healthy culture. We were visited by Bear Grylls, who came and gave a presentation to us. If you don't know him, he's one of those outdoorsmen that has a TV show. Uh, but he talked about how his faith and how his faith helped him overcome his fears and how we are able to survive in the situations of life because of faith. We also had an executive from the Disney company come and tell us about the effectiveness of leadership and what it means to be uh, part of an organization that sees doing better for the community and serving the world is a way that we can make this world a better place. And we were inspired, we were encouraged, we had the opportunity to learn a lot, and it was a great opportunity for our staff. And it was an investment for us to say that we need to have effective leaders throughout our organization as elders, trustees, deacons, small group leaders, volunteers that work with our children and youth ministries, our music ministry. We need effective leadership in each and every arena. And so we had a joy of having that for two days, coming back a little pumped up and excited to be a part of what's going to be next in the life of this church. But one thing that happens at conferences all the time, this is what happens, is we're always asked some questions. And this happened to me that every person I met while I was there, they would ask, well, what do you do? And I tell them I'm a pastor. And here's the question that I will always be asked. What is the size of your church? And that's the question that I will be asked, and I find it whenever there is a church conference, whenever there's a business conference, whenever they find out who you are, maybe this happens to you in business when you go to the conference, what's the size of your staff? What's the size of your company? How much profit have you made, if they're going to be bold enough to ask you that sort of thing? And the mentality that we begin to see is that we think in this world that larger is better. The larger things are, the greater it is, the more effective it is, and that becomes the, the model. That's what we become or we begin to elevate in our world and in our culture. And it even happens in the church. I want to tell you, I went on a study leave to Cambridge University many years ago, and I was studying at Tyndale House. And every day at 2 o'clock, we had high tea. So everybody would leave their cubicle, and they would come to a common area, and we'd have uh, shortcake, we'd have uh, tea, and we'd have wonderful opportunity to engage in conversation with other people. And this was the first day that I was there, and I remember this person asked, well, what's the size of your church? And I remember my response that I got from him when I gave him the answer, because I said this. Well, the church that I was serving in was small, and so I was a little embarrassed by its size. And I said, well, we're only a church of about 150 people. 
And I remember this response. He said, oh, you Americans. And I just politely said, well, I'm a Canadian. Um, so, <laughs> but he, and the politeness is one of the failures and weaknesses of Canadians. We're always polite whether uh, we want to. Maybe that's one of the, uh, well, anyway, I'll go off on another tangent. <laughs> and he said, you need to understand, I come from Scotland. And he said, the size of your church is larger than most churches in that country. And I remember that to this day because I had allowed the cultural's understanding that larger is better infiltrate my mind. And I was looking for self-pity by saying only 150 people. My pride was so large that I disguised it as self-pity. And I was allowing the proud heart to well up. And I did a good job of trying to disguise it and make it look like something else. And that's the struggle. That's the difference between God's ways and the world's ways. That we need to understand that in God's kingdom, it is far different than what we think. I've used that phrase inside out, upside down, and backwards to help us grasp and, and tackle that conception. The gospel is countercultural. It goes against the grain of what we believe and what we think. So in a world that says everything is, has to be larger and better, God's kingdom has a different story for us to hear, a different way of looking at life and looking at perspective. And this is what the Beatitudes begin to reveal to you and me about how different God's kingdom is than what we originally thought it was. And he's trying to help us understand what it means to be a part of this kingdom, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to be a Christian. He's laying out the framework for us to understand that God's ways are so different than the world's ways. And he wants you to grasp that. He wants you to understand it. And he's calling you to that kind of life. This is what the Christian life is all about. So when you sit there and think that I need to be more like the world in order for me to reach the world, Jesus would tell you there's a different path that I want for you. And that path is to be more like me so that you can reach the world. Because the world needs to understand that their ways are not going to lead to inheriting the earth that we're going to see this morning. Or being comforted, that the scriptures told us last week, if we're poor in spirit. And those who mourn. That's the way of the kingdom. And it's not an act of weakness. It's not making us less than something else. Actually, living this way and according to God's ways are our greatest strength. But it begins by understanding our weakness and understanding who we are. And isn't that what the scriptures do to us? As we begin to open up the word of God and we look at ourselves, it really becomes a mirror. That's what the Bible is meant to do, for us to take a deep look at who we are and where our heart is. And to see how the ways of the world have slowly encroached into our life to where we might even mask pride and self-pity and think woe is me because I don't have what I think the world wants me to have and Jesus speaks loudly to a, a group of people who had gathered on a mountainside to hear him preach and he began to preach the way of the kingdom so if you have your Bibles I'd love for you to turn to Matthew chapter 5 it's the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount it's the first sermon that's recorded in the book of Matthew and Matthew is written around certain sermons and and discussions that Jesus had and this is the first one and Matthew wants you to understand that the kingdom life is so different from the world so hear the word of God Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, and blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, and blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. And rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then Jesus goes on to say, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. And he points out this new life that he's called us to and shows us this new way that we are to live. We're not to put our security in our success or in our accomplishments in life or the pursuit of power, or the pursuit of control, or all of these things that we entertain in our life, all these things that we try to pursue, Jesus is trying to get to your heart to show you how proud you truly are and how Christ-like he desires us to be. Your security is to be in Christ alone and nothing else. So let's pray and ask the Lord to give us understanding of this passage this morning. Lord, we thank you that every time we go into your word, you give us a picture of who you are, of your beauty and of your glory and of your majesty and of your graciousness and mercy. And Father, every time we see ourselves in the scriptures, We see, as Jesus said to these people, that we are poor in spirit, that we're spiritually bankrupt. And that there's nothing that we can put our security in that will give us the hopes and dreams that we had that would lead us to true happiness, except if its foundation is upon you. And that Christ would be at the center and Christ would be preeminent in all of our lives. So we pray that you would give us that understanding this morning, that we would know it even better than we did when we walked in here this morning. That we would marvel at your grace and your mercy that has been shed upon us, that you would love us so much, that you would send your son to rescue us, to bring us out of our darkness, to bring us out of our own ways and bring us into the ways that truly lead to satisfaction and hope. And may we find those more fulfilling than all the other things that chase after our heart. And may we worship you this morning for all of your glory's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Jesus continues to show us this way of the kingdom. He's been reminding you that we need to see ourselves. If we want to have a good perspective of ourselves, we need to understand that we are spiritually bankrupt and there's nothing that we can bring to God. We come with empty hands and we realize that only Jesus Christ can accomplish what we need. And that we understand also that we begin to look at our life and see our spiritual emptiness and we begin to mourn at our sin That's what we were looking at last week, to understand how sinful our sin truly is, and that we become people who grasp what that does and how it wreaks havoc in the world and in our lives, in every aspect of our life. And we begin to understand why Jesus Christ had to come to deal with our problem of our sin and our struggle, and he came and he rescued us, and then we come to this third beatitude this morning, he reminds us that it's the meek that will inherit the earth. Now, we have misconceptions about what the word meek means. Many of us think it's weakness. Our culture thinks it means weakness, and even in the day of Christ, the Greek culture thought that meekness was a weakness, and so they would try to tell you to avoid it as much as you could. But even in our day, I think we do the same thing. If you know Bobby Knight, who was the famous basketball coach at uh, University of Indiana, he, he said this, I believe it was something like this, the meek may inherit the earth, but they'll never or they'll rarely get their rebounds. And he wanted to emphasize, he didn't want any meek player on his basketball team because that's not what's going to help them have success. He saw it as weakness, and I think maybe some of you do too. 
And yet it's the very word that Jesus uses to describe who we become when we become followers of Jesus Christ. We become meek. What does it mean? Maybe we can talk about what it's not. Meekness is not an easygoing attitude that we sometimes think that we need to have. It's not self-pity that I thought I needed to have when I was being measured or thought I was being measured by how successful I was, by the size of the church I served. It's not that way at all. Meekness, if we want to understand it, is to use the word surrender. Meekness is an act of surrender. We're poor in spirit. We realize that we're spiritually bankrupt. We know that our sin is so large that it required God to come and do something for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. It required a supernatural act of God to come and rectify what we did in this world. And then we come to this and we begin to realize that we come in surrender. We come and realize that we need to surrender ourself. Because that's the problem. Self centered living is what Jesus is attacking here. Understanding that the world was made for us, thinking that we are the one who's the gift to this world around us. We use that kind of phrase about people who are high on themselves. They thought they were God's gift to the world. And you've witnessed that, I think, in the workplace. You might have even witnessed that in your own life where you've thought the same thing, that you had such a high estimation of yourself that someone else may have had to come and tell you to lower it down a little bit. Jesus said the meek will be the ones who inherit the earth, those that will surrender and give their life to God and understand how countercultural this is to our society. It's not what we desire. It's not what we want. We want everything for ourselves, And we go about that, and we go about our daily living thinking that I need to eke this out. I need to create this environment. I need to create success for myself, and I'm going to do it. I'm self-willed, self-sufficient. And that's what we do. We think that we can go to work, apply it to our job situation. And many of us go to work thinking, well, we don't need anyone else around us. We don't need the gifts and the talents of the people that beside us. Apply it into the church situation. And this is what we teach at staff meetings on a regular basis, that we need to understand that we can do harm to the body if we believe that we as directors or leaders of a ministry area in the church don't need the help of the people that are here in the congregation. And when we talk about having volunteers at the church, we talk about the fact that if we don't have volunteers, it's because we are relying upon ourselves and think that we can do it better than having people come in and work with us and volunteer with us. And sometimes in the church, we've enveloped this culture of the world and think that we don't need anyone else. It's easier to do it without other people around. And I think that's true about how we go about our daily living. Maybe your wife will tell you if you're a husband that will never take directions and you will always sit there and say, I know where I'm going, but you always get lost. And so your wife is elbowing you right now to remind you that you needed her to help you understand that we need other people, that we need to understand that self is what destroys. Self is what leads to the sinfulness of our heart, a craving to fulfill our own desires. Meekness is an act of surrender. It's acknowledging who we truly are. It's, it's looking at Scripture, and we've just heard that we're weak. We're spiritually bankrupt. We mourn because of the sin and the amount of sin in our life. That should give us pause to think that we're so wonderful and to think that we're God's gift to the world. You see, we have this desire to be in control of all things, Have you experienced that with people in your workplace? And even in the church, we have a desire to control things. And we don't like not being in control, so we're going to work hard at controlling the environment. We're going to try to do that. But do you realize that God sometimes stops and intervenes into your life and puts you in situations where you're completely at a loss of control? 
so when we might lose our job, and there's nothing that we can do except for either rely on somebody else or rely on God if we're a Christian to carry us through that experience, we have total loss of control, and the Lord is teaching us to trust him and to rely upon him and see that when we put our trust in him, we will find true happiness, even though there might be a dark day in our life. And that's what Jesus is trying to help us understand. We need to understand our pride makes us self-sufficient. And we go on living our life self-willed. And we go on living our life according to our own ways. And Jesus is telling you, you need to surrender. You need to give it all up if you want to find the happiness that the scriptures are speaking of here. That's where true contentment and satisfaction will be in relying upon him in that way. So meekness is a complete reliance upon God. It's humility. And God said he will exalt those who are humble, that he'll lift them up. He will lift up those that are humble. In our world, it tells us those who are strong, those who are mighty, that's who we're going to lift up. It's those that are powerful, those who are in control, that's what we'll lift up. But in God's kingdom, it will not be that way. It will be the meek, it will be the humble, it will be the one who surrenders, the one who has a proper perspective of themselves. And the scriptures help you understand yourself. But maybe there's some passages in scripture that might help us have a better picture. There are two people that are mentioned in the Bible who were meek. The first was Moses. In the book of Numbers, in chapter 12, verse 3, it says this, Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all the people were on the face of the earth. Now when I hear that verse, when I read that verse, I sit there and I have a different perspective of Moses. I I thought Moses was brash. I thought Moses was the one who took the rod and struck the rock because he was doing his own way. But then as you begin to look at Moses' life over the period of time, you begin to see how the Lord transformed Moses. Wasn't he the one that murdered someone and then he went off into the wilderness? Well, in that wilderness, the Lord began working on his heart, showing him his pride. And Moses was transformed by the grace of God. And he became a meek man who understood his weakness, understood Humility understood what surrender was. So when the people of Israel were led by him, he didn't want that leadership. He said, Lord, why me? I'm really not the person that can do it. We begin to see his heart. To think of him leading over a million plus people, probably over two million people, through the wilderness for 40 years. Can you imagine the kind of leadership that was required? You begin to see him become wise in how he would administer leadership over the people. But he became a person who would rely upon God for all things. So he began to realize that the Lord would move them, not when Moses decided it was time to pick up the tent of the tabernacle and then move it. He waited for the Lord to do it. And when they picked up all the tent of the tabernacle and they began to move to the next location, he let God go before them as a visible picture to the people of Israel that God is going to lead us. And that's really what Jesus is trying to tell you about what your life is to be, that you should let him lead you and mark the path for you and you would follow after him like a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of smoke in the day. Moses relied upon God and he put his trust in him. When they were escaping from Egypt, Moses knew there was nothing in his own strength to be able to leave the Egyptian situation. And the Lord used him as a vessel, but it was God who was doing that work, and he was open to the Lord's leading, and he did what the Lord asked him to do. And then even when they get to the Red Sea, and he's there, and he sees the enemy coming in their chariots, and Moses has the Red Sea behind him, he listens to the Lord, and he hears the Lord say, I will provide a way for you. And God opens up the water of the Red Sea, and the people of Israel cross on dry ground. And then when the enemy comes, the Lord brings the water 
and sweeps it over the Egyptians. And the Lord provided for God's people. And Moses was a meek man who relied upon the power and the strength of God. And he wasn't measuring his success by how large a group of people he was serving. But he was measuring it by how large his God was. That's why Moses is called meek more than all the people who are on the face of the earth. That's a staggering statement about him. And maybe your perspective of Moses needs to change to have the proper understanding about how he trusted and relied upon the Lord. And it becomes a model for you and me to live as we look at his life in the Old Testament. Now, the second person in the Bible that's spoken of as meek is Jesus Christ. Moses and Jesus. Did you know the Hebrew writer is going to tell us that Jesus is greater than Moses? Greater than Melchizedek? Greater than the high priests? Jesus is greater? Well, Moses was sort of a, a, a picture of Christ for the people in the Old Testament, of what he would be like. And then along comes our Savior, along comes Jesus Christ, and we begin to hear the scriptures tell us that he came and he was meek and lowly. Let me tell you, that was not a weak person. Do you remember when Jesus went through the temple and he turned over the tables? Do you remember him talking to the Pharisees and telling them, the religious leaders of the day, and he boldly stands before them and points to them of their self-centered life and reminds them that they have not worshipped them with their heart, that they only worship him with their lips, and their heart was far from God. That's the meek Savior that we follow. And the scriptures are going to begin to tell us what kind of meekness it looks like. If you have your Bibles, you could turn to Isaiah 53. You don't need to do it right now, but you can do it this afternoon and read that beautiful passage where Isaiah tells us and paints a picture of what this Messiah would be like when he comes. And he said this, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to slaughter and like a sheep that was before his shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. You see, he was despised and rejected and he didn't say anything back. Think about Jesus for a moment on the cross. And the people were jeering at him. The people were crying out to him. They were mocking him as he hung there on that Friday afternoon. And they were saying all sorts of things about him. And they were yelling at him, Jesus, if you truly are the Son of God, then show us your power and bring yourself down off the cross. And Jesus was silent. But he had some words to say, and we've heard the seven sayings of Jesus upon the cross, and one of those sayings was this, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's the way of the kingdom. That's the way of Christ followers. When Jesus was despised and rejected, instead of jeering back at them, instead of bringing all of God's power down upon them, he remained prostrate on the cross, surrendering his life for you and for me because of our poorness in spirit, our magnitude of our sin and he hung there on our behalf and he allowed the people to mock him and jeer him. Now I want to ask you to put yourself in the position of Christ. If you were the one hanging there and people were rejecting you and despising you and saying all sorts of things about you, how would you respond? I believe all of us would be there ready to bring back strength if we could ready to say something with our lips that we would regret to say, I think we would jeer right back down at them. And I think if we were given the opportunity to have heaven's fire come down, we would have used it that day. And we would have smited our enemy because of our pride in our heart. And so the scriptures tell us in Philippians 
have this mind among yourselves, which is in Jesus Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself. He became meek by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. You see, this is the type of Savior we follow. We follow a Lord who would pick up a basin and a towel. On the week just before he is about to mount on that cross and be betrayed by one of his closest followers. And he would take that cloth and he would take that basin, he would get down on his knees and he would go to each one of his followers, each one of his disciples, and begin washing their feet. And even in that story, you hear Peter's pride come out. Oh, not me, Lord. You see, he wanted the self-pity that I was looking for. And we begin to see Peter saying, no, no. And Jesus has to tell Peter, no, Peter, this is what needs to happen. We have a towel and basin Savior to show you and to remind you of his meekness and his humbleness and his power. And the scriptures say to us in Mark chapter 10, he came to not be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That's the kind of Savior we follow. And it begins to start pointing out, if he's like that, then I need to be like him. I need to be more Christ-like. I need to be more a model of who he is. And so I want to ask you, how Christ-like are you? We've just heard in our catechism question, that sanctification is this idea of becoming more and more Christ-like because we have been declared righteous because of what Jesus did in his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. So we become more Christ-like. If you're a kingdom child, this is what you look like. You will be poor in spirit. You will mourn over your sin, and you will be meek and understand that yourself is not the center of the universe, but Jesus Christ is to reign and rule in your heart. And you will begin to deny yourself, because that was what Jesus said. If you want to follow after me, I want you to deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. So Oswald Chambers said on September 13th, in my utmost for his highest, this was part of his citation that day. He said, the surrender here is of myself to Jesus, with his rest at the heart of my being. He says, if you want to be my disciple, you must give up your right to yourself and to me. And once this is done, the remainder of your life will exhibit nothing but the evidence of this surrender. And you never need to be concerned again with what the future may hold for you. Whatever circumstances you may be in, Jesus is totally sufficient Moses learned that in his desert wilderness wandering. And the people of God have been learning that in their spiritual wilderness of wandering. That complete surrender will bring us the greatest of joy and satisfaction. So Bonhoeffer said this, to deny oneself is to be aware only of Christ and no more of self. To see only him who goes before and no more the road which is too hard for us. Once more, all that self-denial can say is he leads the way, keep close to him. That's his encouragement to you and to me. And this is what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount. Keep close to me. If you want happiness and you want satisfaction, I will lead you right to the fountain source. And it begins in self denial. Our world is famous for being self-absorbed, famous for self-adulation, famous for being self-centered, self-righteous, self-sufficient, self-willed. And I went into the dictionary to see how many words had self in the front of it. For the fun of it, go there this afternoon and begin to see yourself written there. It marks the selfishness that is there, but Jesus comes to us. And he calls us to surrender our life, to give up our pursuit of all those things that will lead us far and far away from God and to fall and cling to the cross of Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior who came not to be served, 
not to be selfish, but came to offer himself to others. And this is why the church needs to be a display of that selflessness. Why we desire to be a church that's outward focused. For we understand that we are here to serve this world. And the parable, not the parable, but the Beatitudes ends saying, you will inherit the earth. Heaven and all of its joy is yours. When you're poor in spirit, when you mourn over your sin, and when you live a life of surrender and make God the center of all who you are. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would show us that truth this morning. To show us that true happiness comes in surrender of giving it all up and emptying our hands and standing before you and relying upon you and you alone. Oh, Lord, may we see Christ and see the kind of Savior he was for us. Despised and rejected, yet he was silent like a sheep going before the shearers. Father, we desire to be like you. Would you continue to mold us and shape us into the image of your son so that you would receive all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.